broadcaster at I thought that wasn't on. I'm a broadcaster at ABC Radio National, but my training is as a historian, and I have to confess that's my first love. And I'm in the very lucky position at the moment of being attached to the John Oxley Library. I've been formally given the extremely grand title of historian in residence, but as I've already said to a few people in the audience this morning, it's more like dilettante in residence because I'm getting to leap in and out of the John Oxley collection, see what's there, and enjoy that enormously. Um, and also with me today is uh, Raymond Evans. We're not related, that's just lucky chance. And Ray, of course, is he really deserves the uh, title of historian in residence, as, as he does for Queensland, I think. Um, he's written many books, but in particular, A History of Queensland and, um, and Radical Brisbane. And also Matt Condon, author and journalist, who's recently published the beautiful uh, book by New South Books in Brisbane. While this um, talk today has been called Is Queensland Different? It would be a bit of a stretch to call it a debate. More of a discussion to which we're all bringing um, a personal perspective, uh, which w will emerge as we all talk, because we all have a different relationship to Queensland, which I think itself tells us something about the history of Queensland and how we might engage with it. And after we've each made our little spiels, we're going to have a discussion with the three of us and also throw it open to the audience. But we'd, um, we'd like to start with Raymond. Will I talk from up here? Wherever you feel comfortable. Oh, I'll... Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as uh, Kate says, I, I'm the author of, of one of the more recent general histories of Queensland. And if you happen to dip into that book, uh, you'll discover uh, lots of ways in which Queensland is different from the other Australian states and even some uh, explanations of why this might be so. Um, I think probably all the states have their own idiosyncrasies and they're all different from one another to a degree, but maybe Queensland is a bit more different than, than most. But in the spirit of light-heartedness today, I, I thought I'd approach this talk as less of an historian and more as a human being, because I, I want to talk a little to you about my own and my parents' early impressions of Queensland when we arrived here um, as 10-pound migrants from Wales in early 1949, quite a long time ago. Because to arriving migrants like us, Queensland seemed very different, not just from the rest of Australia, but from the rest of the world. Uh, Queensland, to the outsider, was definitely weird. But it was also at the time so insular and rigidly conformist a place um, that um, few of the locals seemed to see how peculiar it really was. They all thought that their strangeness was completely normal. So everyone was intent here, it seemed, on marching to the same bizarre drumbeat. And even more amazingly at the time, Queenslanders seemed to think that this so-called normal behaviour was also thoroughly British. At the first bars of the British National Anthem, they'd all snap smartly to attention. It was a bit like um, uh, Venusians pretending to be earthlings. Even the British didn't do this, and certainly not the Welsh. As Welsh and British ourselves, we looked around us and were flummoxed and not a little discombobulated. We didn't understand their customs and habits. We didn't understand their language. Because these peculiar locals spoke in a language full of odd and perplexing expressions. What we called fields and meadows, uh, they called paddocks. And, uh, what, um, and all girls and women to them, uh, no matter what their names, were called Sheila. <laughs> look, at the, look, at she look at the Sheila over there. Here come some more Sheilas, you know. Um, and one quickly had to learn to, to distinguish between, for instance, a Zac and an Anzac, or a Mango and a Drongo. And they said uh, <laughs> incomprehensible things like Bonza and uh, Grouse and Dinky Die and uh, You Butte and Struth and uh, Fair Suck of the Sauce Bottle and Wacko the Diddle-O and Chooks. And, uh, Whenever they ran fast, they said they ran like billy -o. 
though I could never discover who this champion Queensland sprinter Billy O really was. And what about this? Get your togs out of the low boy and put them in the port. I go, huh? And, and, they, and then the guy says, you know, don't be a dill. The low boy in the sleep out. Chop, chop. And I'm just utter confusion. You know, what is this language? They dropped their G's and, and picked up their O's. So they'd say, John O, give us the land of a shillin', will yous? They always said, give us, even when there was no one else there. And they usually found it essential to further pluralise the word you. So you might hear, I thought I told you as kids not to go walk about down the paddock. Paddock, you'd better run like Billy O and get back up here, or you'll get a good belton. Now get inside, or I'll give you all the, the the switch. In Wales, the switch was just something that turned on the light, turned on and off the light. So I could never. Um, initially understand why it held such terrors. I started to imagine that it might have something to do with electric shocks. I was, I was ready for anything. I was living on my nerves. These Queenslanders lived in strange houses set on high stilts, only they called these stilts stumps. To us, a stump was something left behind when a human limb was amputated. Of course, the black stump was something else again. Beyond the black stump was a place you didn't much fancy going to, a bit like the blanket show or the tick gates or whoop whoop. They, they were also a highly informal people who dressed or undressed to suit the weather. Many kids running around with bare feet, which would never happen in Wales, and the men around the suburbs often in blue singlets. We call these singlets vests. They called them Jackie Howes, and khaki shorts, of course, and sand shoes. They also burped ostentatiously and competitively, especially after drinking Forex, that strange beverage. The Evans family called burping gulping, and we were apologetic when we did it. You couldn't get these people to talk about politics in a blue fit, but they spoke boisterously and with great hilarity about farting. The Evanses never used that word. Instead, we spoke in hushed tones about letting off. <coughs> Thus, in our house, Raymond, did you just let off in you? Rather than, you little shit, did you just fart? <laughs> no, ma'am, I only gulped. And they, um, they seem to be the only people in the world to eat, la to eat large amounts of a strange brown sub a substance that they called eat a peanut paste. In Wales, paste was something you used to put up wallpaper. Would you like to try a peanut paste sandwich, mate? Oh, no, thank you very much. We'd come here from a benign British countryside of rolling fields and woodlands, but now we found ourselves confronted by a more treacherous environment and plants with attitude and with disturbing names like bindi eyes and cobbler's pegs and waiter wiles and blady grass and stinking rogers and most insidious of all, pee the beds. Instead of um, having what we recognised as bark, the trees often looked as though they were suffering from a bad skin disease. Some of them even bled, for God's sake. And, and where we came from, insects mostly seemed to know their place, but here even ants had attitude, not to mention the mosquitoes, the cockroaches, the ticks, the funnel webs, the red backs and the stick insects. I mean, my father would say to me, you think you're just picking up a stick, but then it turns into a bloody insect. <laughs> my mother would say, no, don't you go picking up any sticks to me. So there was certainly a lot to look out for in the Queensland of my childhood. If you want to re-enter a truly bizarre world, just sit down sometime and read carefully through several months of the Courier Mail in the 1950s. This is just one example. Front page story in 1956 from the Courier Mail headed 80 arrested at Tawong for bingo. And the story tells how, in a carefully executed sting operation, 
licensing squad police surrounded the Tawong Amateur Recreation Club and netted 80 startled patrons caught in the nefarious act of playing bingo. And then the courier had a little column explaining what this this um, dangerous uh, gambling activity was. Around midnight, they were ferried in ten paddy wagons to the watch house. At least the bulls didn't have tasers in those days. We named our first dog Bingo to mark the event. <laughs> or better still, have a look at a, a newspaper of the time called the Brisbane Truth. In 1956 and 1957, for instance, the front page of Truth could be devoted to small mugshot photos of around a dozen or so non-British migrants who also happened to be convicted criminals. And then the headlines ran, Migrant scum, murdered by mad migrants. Deport this migrant beast. The mad migrants campaign was on. It continues for a month in the truth in 1957 leading to pages of hate mail directed at foreigners from the response of citizens of Queensland that then went on for another five weeks, these, this letter campaign. This, this followed upon a number of shock articles attacking homosexuals in 1956 in, in The Truth. Under the heading, Lash Needed, one upright reader from Cecil Plains writes, despite the opinion of crackpots, these people are like wild beasts and should be treated as such. It is the most filthy and corrupt disease known to modern times. Now, there still seems to be some concern about this around certain Brisbane bus shelters today. But as I say, there was certainly a lot to look out for in Queensland of my youth. You had to be on the lookout for bodgies and for loonies, for poofters or homos, as well as commos, abos, alcos, Drongos, winos, dagos and refos, all these dangerous O groups. People who didn't speak in English in public were looking to get bashed. And you also had to learn to watch yourself. If you didn't watch yourself, you could end up in Bogger Road or even worse in Goodna. I didn't originally know what or where these places were, but they sounded worse than Whoop Whoop or Beyond the Black Stump. At my second school concert at Barden Infant School in 1950, I was cast as one of the ten little nigger boys, the one who fell into a swamp, and then there were three. We wore black balaclavas with thick red lips sewn on and candy-striped black and white minstrel suits. We received a standing ovation from the parents. Oh yes, we heard a lot of talk in Queensland about so-called niggers, in this era. There they were in the rhymes we, uh, we chanted, in the jokes we told, in the games we played, in the comics we read, the cartoons we saw at the Saturday matinee, even on the licorice show bags we bought at the Ecker. I had a nigger money box. You put a penny in his hand, pulled down a lever at the back and he threw it obligingly into his big grinning mouth. And in town was the lucky nigger boy casket agency over the road from Anzac Square with a statue of another happy-go-lucky black boy sitting by the front door. People patted his head for luck. Oh yes, we knew all about niggers in those days, just like we thought we knew all about Queensland. Queensland was easy to understand, it was generally thought. Nothing much had ever happened in Queensland. The first time I learnt about the Queensland Native Mounted Police was when I was nine or ten in the mid-1950s. I was skimming avidly through a copy of Man magazine in the bedroom of a friendly neighbourhood bodgy. I was pursuing the rare quarry of airbrushed nudes, I must admit, rather than examining it for the articles, but one article caught my eye nevertheless. The illustration accompanying it was like a scene from the American West. It was the American West, surely. But those weren't Indians being shot down by those uniformed men on horseback. They looked like Aborigines. Surely not. But then I spotted the word Queensland. I stared in disbelief. I couldn't take my eyes off it. Surely this couldn't have happened in Queensland, where nothing had happened. <laughs> 
In retrospect, I think that this was the day I started to become a Queensland historian. So it's certainly strange, isn't it, what surreptitiously looking for nudes and consorting with bodgies can eventually take you to. Thanks. Thank you, and now over to Matt Condon. Ray, that was fabulous. And I'm reminded of, with your little nigger boy story that um, last year we published in Q Weekend magazine an article looking at the first anniversary of Kevin Rudd's apology to Indigenous people. And we asked um, many Queensland Indigenous people about what had happened to them and had they seen progress during that year. And we did a beautiful photo shoot and we got, we got Aboriginal lawyers and we got professional business people and we put them in the studio. It was a beautiful photo spread. And I don't think we've ever had more male response to anything than that article. The bulk of it, bulk of the mail was, um, how dare you put black people in a magazine of this quality and um, how much did it cost to dress them up and um, black people don't wear suits. So... That was only last year. Um, I don't want to start on a negative note, but um, this question of um, are Queenslanders or is Queensland different? I would say yes, but I, don't, I, I haven't quite found the answer and in what way. Um, similarly to Raymond's family, my grandmother um, came out from... She was born in Reading and came out... Um, on a boat with her family in the 1920s and they washed up in Brisbane. Um, there was, there's some mystery, there's many mysteries in my family and my mother is still keeps many closets locked under strict lock and key. Um, and I think I've spent my life trying to knock down those doors. I haven't knocked all of them down, I've got through some of them. But um, there seems to be a mystery as to why they left England and I ch I've been checking the census um, records over there and um, lo and behold, a, um, a house, a, a, a young woman pops up in the census. She's a boarder in this house where my, my grandmother's family is living and then ultimately she becomes the wife of, my, um, of my, um, one of my grandmother's brothers. So there was a, maybe there was a little scandal in there, I'm not sure, but nevertheless they came out to Brisbane in the 1920s and um, lived under a house in Tawong um, when they first arrived on bare earth floors and um, they never had much money through their entire lives but um, my grandmother died in um, 1996 and about a fortnight before she died I was with her in the nursing home and um, I said, Gran, you know, have you enjoyed your life in Brisbane? And she didn't even look at me, she just stared straight ahead and said, I've loathed every minute of it. <laughs> it was, I think, she, was, she had very lovely fine skin, English, she hated the heat. She could never come to terms with the humidity of Brisbane. Every summer she loathed and dreaded the onset of summer. And, um, I think I like to think in her imagination that she was, living, she was a little girl living in Reading and it was you know, snowing in wintertime. Um, so we are a sort of potpourri of um, many different people and not all of those people um, at, um, successfully graft onto the host that is Queensland, I guess. Um, I published my little book on Brisbane last year and uh, the journey of that has been, was very interesting. I, when I was offered the commission... Um, I'd been living away from Brisbane for two decades and um, I'd been back for a few years and my instantaneous naive assumption was that I, this would be, an, would be a breeze. I was born in Brisbane. Um, I thought I knew Brisbane. Um, I was Mr. Brisbane. So I said yes to the book and then um, faced a, a, an eight-month writer's block. I had no idea how to wrestle my home city onto the page and in, in, sh in sheer and utter despair because the publishers were emailing me every fortnight saying how's the book going and I'd say it's terrific, it's the narrative's really flowing beautifully and in a panic I went down to the John Oxley Memorial Obelisk down at North Quay praying that a door would open for me and I would find a way into the book 
And, and sure enough, I found the wording on the plaque very strange, very strangely written. And I also couldn't get over the fact that um, John Oxley, the smart young surveyor general that he was, I couldn't understand why he would step ashore and clamber up a 10 metre cliff to get to the top and, and say, this is Brisbane, this is where the settlement will, will happen. When 500 metres down near William Street, he could have just rowed the boat and stepped out of the boat. And why would he clamber up a massive cliff um, like that and say, here we are? And thus it turned out that um, um, the plaque was put in the wrong place. So the book, that was the investigation that got me into the book. And I've only, only realised much later, after the publication of the book, that in fact it, it, the book was something else. It was me... It was, a, it was a way of me trying to reacquaint myself with my hometown. I was, in a sense, writing my way back into the landscape. And um, I see now that that was probably one of the major functions of the book, um, as opposed to anything else. But the book does deal with that, this curious question of our difference. And um, there's some lovely... David Maloof has written some beautiful... Stuff, uh, stuff about um, our city and state. And this to me is as good an um, entry point into answering this question as any, and it's from an essay David wrote um, many years ago called A First Place, The Mapping of a World. And um, he's talk he talks about the Brisbane topography and says, um, walk 200 metres in almost any direction outside the central city and you get a view, a new view, it is all gullies and sudden vistas. And, and David then writes, wherever the eye turns here, it learns restlessness and variety and possibility as the body learns effort. Brisbane is a city that tires the legs and demands a certain sort of breath. It is not a city, I would want to say, that provokes contemplation in which the mind moves out and loses its, itself in space. What it might provoke is drama, and a kind of intellectual play, delights in new and shifting views, and this because each new vista as it presents itself here is so intensely colourful. And I think there's a lot to be said about that quote in the respect that David, com David compares the geography or the topography of the city to, say, Melbourne or Adelaide, where, you can, where you, the mind can expand out, as he says, and you can, it can push to the horizon, whereas in Brisbane... Um, as, he, as he writes, turn, turn one direction and you, you're looking at something completely new. I had a discussion with a friend who was born and bred in Sydney and she's been in Brisbane for three years now and she says, the river drives me crazy. And I say, why do you say that? And she says, she says I am permanently lost in Brisbane. I can never get my bearings because of that damn river, you know which is very true too, but it's just it's, it's magnificent coiling. And um, I write in this book that in, in many ways it feels like it's intentionally trying to disorient you. Um, I think we have to factor into our subtropical weather um, and the light, the, that very, very special light of Brisbane, which David Malouf has written about also. And... I write about it in this book, about especially, for example, in high summer where, where everything is so bright and white and glary that it almost erases the human activity. It's, um, and, and that light casts very, very dark black shadows. And that too could be metaphorically explored in terms of how we are very different. Um, I was giving a, a talk about this book the other day and there was a young man in the back of the audience and he was originally from Melbourne but he'd been up here for about 20 years and um, he, he sort of grabbed me later and said, you know, I'm, I'm so passionate about Queensland, I love Queenslanders and they're always so, you know, they say what they mean and everything's so dramatic. Again, we come back to the Maloof quote and um, there's so much passion, he said, which you just don't get. I never, I never sensed that when I lived in Melbourne. And I think, I think that's very true, that um, we are passionate. We are a passionate people. I think we're an aggressive people. 
in many ways. Um, and I think that has something to do with our, our history. And Raymond is a great historian and would know better than I. But I have written, I did sort of hint at that as a way of trying to understand you know, who we are as Queenslanders in this little book. Um, let me try and find it for you. This is a little piece. Uh, I was thinking back to when I was an expatriate, a Queensland expatriate, and then the difference when you come back, when you come home after many years. Um, and I, so I write, when I was a Brisbane expatriate, I look back at the city as a place of childhood and as childlike. To leave Brisbane, at least for some of us, was to leave your childhood. There are, there are as many reasons for expatriatism as there are people, but it, it could be political, personal, psychological. Uh, but the Brisbane expatriate is different from that of, say, Sydney or Melbourne, London or New York. No matter where they are, Brisbane people find each other and can fill years with their grizzling and disparaging of their birthplace. I know of no city in Australia that produces such consistent bile as Brisbane does. Conversely, Brisbane people I've known who strike out for the big smoke want to impress to others, or perhaps just to themselves, that they no longer live in a hick town. And they then attract every cliché of their adopted city like iron filings to a magnet. They overcompensate. They tip too far the other way. They out-Sydney Sydney-siders in their rush to abandon a dull ho-hum past. They hastily lacquer themselves with the cultural totems or tribal mannerisms of their new home to the point where they stand out as ill-defined collages. They may even expunge Brisbane from their curriculum vitae altogether or shrewdly hide it. Brisbane, as a spoken word, has little poetry and comes off the tongue with more strine than other capitals, Brisbane. I was probably one of these people until the weight of wearing another city's clothes got too cumbersome. You always hear when you're away from Brisbane too, Brisbane's a great city to bring up children, which is why I allude to that childlike quality. And there was a, a lovely um, thesis written by a woman called Catherine Burns a few years ago, um, and she described um, that notion of Brisbane, Queensland, and a sort of childishness. And she wrote, expatriate Queensland writers remember the warm climate and, and verdant fecundity through a veil of nostalgia, so that the region itself becomes associated with Eden and the timeless world of childhood. And I find that very interesting too, because you, I will often look around um, and am astonished at, for example, a minor example, how many, how many grown men there are in Brisbane wearing their, their football team's little shorts, and, and they're riding little children's bicycles, and you see them pumping around the inner city in their football jersey, and, it's like, and they'd be 50 years old, you know, it's 40 years old, it's quite, it just reminds me of that, that childish quality, I'm not disparaging it, but it, it, is, it does seem to me to be a place where children can thrive very, very well. Um, I also write too that, um, and Raymond can dispute this, but Brisbane-born people had chips on their shoulders, they had it when the settlement was treated by the colony of New South Wales as a useless village for hardened criminals. They had it as their toil and sweat in a tough part of the country was converted into income for the powers that be in Sydney. They had it when they separated from New South Wales and they had it in the 1980s after almost 20 years of state rule under the Kingaroy peanut farmer Sir Joe Bjorki Peterson. Joe became a national joke and Queenslanders along with him. He and his, and his colleagues continued Brisbane's perennial yoke to the colonial paradigm of rural wealth and power. Brisbane has always been a town with a whiff of cow and horse dung about it. And with Joe, a simple but cunning premier, it remained a big country town with the boss up in the big house. So I think too there's a sort of, there was a sort of unspoken squatocracy that continued through in this state um, for many, many years. I'm also interested too in, as I mentioned earlier, that Queenslanders can be aggressive. I'm not sure whether that's related to the origins of Brisbane, a very violent place. Um, but, you, but you see it all the time. But conversely, you see a sort of, sort of feigning um, 
acquiescence to authority. We, we get a parking ticket and we rush to pay the council. And we, we, we seem to, to do what we're told very easily. Um, and I think Ra- Raymond may want to discuss this further because his book, his book, if you haven't read it, Radical Brisbane, um, is an absolutely brilliant piece of work. And uh, I learned more about that, my city from that book than probably most. But um, we see road rage. I saw two men um, fist fighting on the side of the gateway highway the other day and then, then they hopped in their cars and they chased each other in their vehicles like it was a movie. And yet we... There's very, little, um, there's very little community coordination around an idea that, they, that we dislike. For example, you look at the Regent Theatre and its impending demolition. Now, now there was a petition, an online petition organised to save the Regent. It attracted tens of thousands of signatures. Yet the actual physical protest in the city nominated on a certain day and there wouldn't have been 200 people there. So I'm interested in why we don't stand up for ourselves or we don't question authority. And I'm just wondering if it's to do with the, the old convict A-frame that wasn't very far away from the uh, executive building and the government suites up there on the ridge um, near George Street. So I'm just posing these as questions as a way of trying to understand you know, who we are. And um, maybe we could yak, yak about some of those points. Thank you. I'm, I'm tempted just to keep asking questions, but I'll, I'll do my little spiel first. I guess when you look at the three of us, Matt was born and, and grew up here, and Raymond came here as a migrant. And what I bring to the discussion, I guess, is that I came to Brisbane to live a bit, a bit over five years ago, so I'm one of the people who constantly gets lost around the river. Having previously spent less than a week here, once for a research trip to the National Archives and the John Oxley Library in its old format, and once to a history conference where I spent all my time inside talking to historians. I came here for love and wrenched myself away from a city whose history and stories I knew, I knew and had absorbed, not only from inside the Mitchell Library, but by walking the streets. So that was what was different about Queensland to me, the embedded history knowing what a suburb meant, understanding which streets ran with blood and which had echoes of tap dancing and riots, which had been hushed by thousands of people lining the streets for a straight state funeral, knowing where Jack Lang had stood in the domain and bellowed out his rage, living in Surrey Hills and knowing about Tilly Devine and the Razor Gangs, or the stories of my own mother in St Peter's and a grandfather who'd gone to the ragged school in the rocks, I knew about the way that history warmed the sandstone of history or spat out the sandstone of Sydney or spat out smoke from a steelworks in Wollongong. I got up here and had to reorient myself to think about which history I knew. It's disconcerting to look at a bridge and not know how many people died in the making of it or whether its predecessors had been washed away by a flood. To hear people talking about re-stumping houses when, frankly, they never talk about that in Sydney because there are no stumps. There are slabs of rocks and foundations that go down to a different layer of history. But, of course, in both cities, those foundations, those layers of history, go back to transportation and to convict settlement. In both places, their stories of meetings across and next to the water with Aboriginal people. In both places, their stories of migration and of movement. Both places have their series of islands and outposts, their sites of exclusion. Cockatoo Island in the harbour was a place for convicts, a site for a home for wayward girls. It then became a shipyard and so was connected to those national and international strikes and agitation in the 1920s and 30s. And then there's the island that's not an island in Sydney, which is La Perouse, an important site for the Eora people of the region and also the site for a leprosarium. Now here in Moreton Bay, there's St Helena, the prison island, and Peel Island. I was lucky enough to go to Peel Island last year and make a radio program on its history. What a place. A quarantine station and then briefly an inebriate's home. It then housed a purpose-built leprosarium built deliberately along racial lines, and you can still see the impact. You can still see those buildings. (laughs) 
the so-called coloured quarters are still there, built of corrugated iron with their low roofs off to the side. And then in the 1940s, those coloured patients were moved away from Peel Island and up to Friday Island, way up north. So learning these stories and shocking myself with which national stories I did and didn't know helped me to start to understand this place. The fact people were sent from a homeland in Moreton Bay right up north also taught me about looking to the north. And it helped me make sense of what historian Regina Ganter has said about what happens when we tell the story of the nation from the top down. If we begin with the contact through trip hanging off the Northern Territory or pearling in the Torres Strait, if we remember how close PNG is, if we remember Cooktown and not just Botany Bay, it's a different story. But what I struggle with, I guess, is how much these are Queensland stories and how much they're national stories or even transnational or international ones. So as I mentioned, I've been in the really privileged position this year of doing some regular research in the John Oxley collection. I've been delving into archive boxes willy-nilly and dragging out stories from all sorts of lives and experiences. Shipboard diaries, letters, ration books, certificates of tobacco use, release forms for sailors. But I wonder what I've really been dragging out. Hopes, dreams, tears, cries of despair and some ragged stockings from a dancing girl. I've learnt the price of peaches in the 1880s and I keep on encountering a surprising number of goats for some reason. But just this week I was reading the letters from 1922 written by an English woman who migrated first to Melbourne and then came to Brisbane to live at Sandgate where her husband sold men's mercery and fine clothing. She was writing to her schoolgirl daughter, Pam, who'd been sent away to England for her own good. And Mummy, because I don't know her name, Mummy was terribly depressed and beside herself. She thought the houses were ugly and it was way too hot. They were living in a lodging house and she kept getting sunburnt. A frog jumped up on her one day and she leapt up in fright and the frog got stuck to the hot glass of the lamp she was riding next to. Meanwhile, she nags her daughter rather a lot about behaving well, and she tells her daughter that they've had to use up all their spare money to send her off to school and to get a better chance, a chance that she wouldn't get in Sandgate. And by the way, she has no friends at all and doesn't know what to do. So whose history is this cry of despair, I wonder? Is it a story of Queensland or the story of migration? A story of dislocation and loneliness? a story perhaps of work or of women's lives, another story of what's often been called lives of quiet desperation. And then there was the papers of a showgirl from the 1940s, Peggy Ryan, and in some ways that's very much a Queensland story because she was a dancer and, let's face it, once I kept going through the records, a stripper too, one of the nudie cuties who held the stage in Brisbane in the 1940s. Her papers are here in the Oxley and I got to trace her, her career as she appeared with her father, an illusionist, in various canvas theatres, otherwise known as tents, all through regional Queensland. They travelled with a Chinese magician and worked wherever they could and she went on stage in choruses behind the scenes. She wore her fishnets. She did panto on the weekend. But she also got on to the Tivoli circuit in Sydney she travelled to Hobart for a few shows and then she found herself back entertaining the troops in Brisbane and all through the north. She even got a self-voted favourite pin-up by one of the American regiments stationed in Brisbane. Again, is that a Brisbane story or a working woman's story, travelling the country, doing whatever work was around, appearing in tabloid write-ups, or a story about being on the road, organising railway passes, working with a very cross-cultural troupe, but in any case, it helps me to look at the landscape, to see what was happening in theatres, to imagine Peggy walking the streets of Brisbane in the 1940s. In the same way that it helped me to know about the boiling down works at Kangaroo Point in the uh, 19th century, the swimming baths along the river, the 1927 royal visit to New Farm Park. To me, 1927 meant the opening of New Parliament House in Canberra, and I traced that story of a royal visit and the politics and all of the things that were happening in Canberra 
then I get here and discover in the, their fabulous outfits and with the strange entourage that is a royal tour, they came to New Farm Park just down the road from where I live. And then there are the papers of Archibald Meston, the journalist and raconteur who wrote in the 1920s, describing Brisbane in the 1870s when he first arrived, and I was reading them recently. And he talks about the eagle at Eagle Street and other features of the city in a very present way. He says, there's a dirty mangrove creek started from where the new town hall is being built, thence down the river where the punt lands today at the foot of Creek Street. That was the creek in which young Petrie was drowned. Where it crossed Crean Street, there was a little overhead bridge for only foot passengers, and the vehicle traffic went round by Eagle Street, so named for an eagle's nest in a grey gum tree there in the penal days. I'd never thought about why Eagle Street was called Eagle Street, and suddenly that place was animated for me and started to make sense. I started to get less lost around the Brisbane River once I start to hear these stories. And then when I read the diary of Scotswoman Ellen Ferguson in 1883, the streets came to life even more in colour because she told me things I needed to know, what the street girls were wearing. She says, A common street girl's ordinary attire when out of doors is ruby velvet turned with cream lace or perhaps peacock blue satin with cream lace, black satin or velvet with gold lace, white or cream silk, white hats with long drooping white feathers, and abundance of jewellery of every description. And what I really like about that is the reminder of what we don't know about the past and how much we might get wrong. She knows what the social cues mean. She understands those colours and textures, that black satin with gold lace is not elegant, but racy, that red velvet isn't so much fashion as being on sale. They're the details we might not know that the texture of history is feathers and lace, as well as dust and the boys who sweep up the horse shit. And for her, that was also a story about the Contagious Diseases Act, an act that hovered over the lives of those working girls and kept them in line and on record, supervised by the police and potentially marked for life. And those stories, those trailing feathers, they're both ordinary and utterly extraordinary and fascinating. They provide a way into the past They help me animate those streets I'm living in. But what I wonder is, are these stories of Queensland or Australia? Or are they more particularly stories about a religious Scotswoman with a strong moral sense and an acerbic sense of humour telling stories to explain this new life to her sister back home on the other side of the world? So I guess what I wonder is why it matters to tell these stories as stories about Queensland and when it matters to tell them as Australian stories, or stories that are much more particular and small than that. And I guess that's one of the things that I'd be curious to, to hear your thoughts on and, in fact, to hear your thoughts on. So thank you for joining us, and I don't know whether there's questions you want to ask immediately to us or whether there's comments between the three of us. I'd be better to open to questions because we're running. Yeah, we're almost running out of time. So uh, <coughs> would people like to put any questions to me or Matt or... Raymond? I just wonder whether our culture has been influenced by government. Um, Those new to Queensland would be unaware of the buy Queensland first rather than buy Australian. So the government is always promoting uh, local economic growth rather than national growth. Did you want to comment on that, Raymond? Well... Yeah, I, I, I mean, this, this Queensland provincialism, you know, goes back a long way. It's not just something that's, that's emerged. You might recall in the 1970s, Bielke Peterson going to Japan and saying, I'm here to tell you we're not Australians, we're Queenslanders, you know. This, this uh, parochialism is very deep in our history, and I think it comes from what you were saying about having a chip on the shoulder, which I fully agree with, and uh, that uh, Queenslanders always felt like they were marginalised, so they had to overcompensate by, uh, you know, promoting themselves um, overly above the fact that they were Australians, that they were Queenslanders. Yes, the thing, the thing too about the, the 70s and the 80s and Bjorki Peterson, now with the benefit of hindsight, um, all of that... Um, you know, he was a very, very smart 
man in some respects. And all of that sort of circus, that, that sort of um, provincial hayseed pantomime that was rolled out year after year, um, in one way that obscured or diverted any serious attention to the government. So if you're, if you're viewed by the southern states or whatever, if they viewed Joe as a clown, then there's no serious scrutiny behind the clown. And there was a, an enormous amount of, well, certainly illegal, but a lot of activity going on that harmed Queensland behind the facade of that, you know, Joe, the peanut farmer sort of gig. The corruption endemic in the ju judicial system, through, the, through, all through government. And Queenslanders are still feeling that today. It's, you know, it may take one or two more generations for that to sort of um, dissipate. But... Um, so pro the provincialism worked, worked, had a couple of functions, I think. Yeah, and, and I think that, that business about presenting Joe as a clown in the South just made Queenslanders flock to his defence more. Mm. There's a song that Randy Newman wrote about one of the southern politicians in the United States, and one of the line, lines are, he may be a fool, but he's our fool. And that, it was kind of like that feeling, you know, you're attacking, when you attack him, you're attacking Queensland. Mm. One of the stories that I was really shocked as somebody who'd done a lot of work on um, Australia's political history and, and a whole lot of other stories that meant that I didn't think I was an expert on Australia, but I was really shocked that I didn't know this story. Um, and it concerns Joe. And that was about the negotiations over the Torres Strait Island Treaty in the 1970s, <coughs> where Queensland, having annexed the Torres Strait in the 1890s, then under the Whitlam government... Um, they were just going to shift the border um, as PNG was, um, became independent. They were just going to shift the border down so that the Torres Strait Islands were cut off and were no longer part of Australia. Now, this was another really interesting case where Joe really cleverly used that sort of idea of Queensland exceptionalism and basically said, bugger off, these people are Queensland citizens. You cannot just change the border like this and remove these people from our state. And while he wasn't famous for being a um, you know, supporter of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues, in this case he was able to use what you could also see as a sort of federal state divide for his own political uses. And, um, and various analysts basically say Whitlam just didn't get it. He missed what was going on here and didn't think through the status of the Torres Strait Island people and their relationship to Queensland. And so that, for me, was another really strong case of where what happens if you look at a national story and you start at the top and you, look down, you get really different perspective. And in that case, it's about international relations, it's about borders, it's about all sorts of things. And really, crucially, it's about what was happening in the Torres Strait. Mm. I, I think one of the functions of seeing Queensland as different is related to the way history has been written in Australia mm. with a Sydney-Melbourne bias, as, as if Sydney and Melbourne and Canberra are this golden triangle that really represents the Australian ethos and it leaves Queensland out. Well, once you start bringing in what happened in Queensland or even in the whole of tropical Australia into the story, you start seeing a whole different Australia to what happens further down in the south, but but the you know the bulk of the history that's been written gives a, a version of a different kind of society. Mm. Mm. Are there any other questions or, or comments? Into, oh, now it's working. Into uh, Bjorka Peterson and the effect. It seems to be an area, uh, being in university in the early 90s, very early 1990, I was very much in university in, in the wake of the Bjorka Peterson era. And it was very influenced uh, that a gathering over a certain number of people was illegal in, in Queensland, if it was a political gathering. Signage, public signage had to be registered with the government or it was illegal. And just with what you said about the protest about the Regent Theatre and how there still is a real lack of uh, willingness to be a part of something like that, I, th I think, and just the, the discussions we've had today, there's an enormous amount of evidence of the Bjorka Pearson era and how much of the legacy is still standing today. 
However, it seems to be a sacred cow that people are not delving into. And I, I'm just wondering if, if it has been delved into or, or if it's just not as um, openly discussed still. Well, it's funny you should mention that. <laughs> I, I'm actually working on um, a book very similar to that right now. Uh, I'm coming at it from an angle of um, essentially um, crime and corruption from the late 1940s through to the 90s. And um, I've been working on it now for maybe 15 or 16 months and have uncovered some very interesting stuff about, well, certainly about um, police corruption, judicial corruption, and most certainly government corruption. Um, it is astonishing that this, that that book has never actually been written before. It is amazing, and you have to ask why, I guess. Um, I'm finding now, though, in t 2011, that um, many, many people have said to me, look, um, a long time has gone by. I'm now happy to talk. So maybe it was a time period thing. I'm not sure, but... Um, and I've done hundreds of interviews so far for this book and uh, many people have agreed to talk to me because they feel, and this is interesting in terms of the writing of history, they feel it's okay now to speak about those issues. And I'm interested in your thoughts when, about the concept of time passing and people finally feel, feeling free that mm. they can speak. You know. Yeah, well, I, I can think of a few examples of that, like, for instance, what went on on the Queensland frontier and people fronting up you know, 20 years later to admit they'd taken part in an Aboriginal massacre because they, they're kind of trying to clear their consciences before they die, maybe, and they'll come out with a detailed account, which they would never have said at the time. One, because they feared prosecution, and two, because very few prosecutions were ever mounted, by the way, but, but, but two, because they were kind of sticking with the, with the code of silence, among all the other perpetrators, but years later, you know, they, they do speak. So, I, yes, I, th I think sometimes there has to be a, um, you know, a period of time between uh, terrible events and the disclosure of those events. There's a lot of... Sorry, Lennon. There, there's a lot of um, work done in the sort of oral history field where there seems to be a 40-year gap that's what happened with the stories about the comfort women in um, Japan and Korea, and that it, that's what happened with a lot of the World War stories. So maybe it's the same. And I must say, oh, I want to read that book. I mean, the reason I said earlier that, um, that what happened in um, the Joe era may not be expunged from the Queensland consciousness for another couple of generations is that I'm coming across people over and over again in the research for this book who many, many people who are now in their 70s and 80s, and their lives were ruined by the activities of um, police, um, politicians. I mean, literally, they're still suffering the ramifications of being framed for various criminal um, activities, charges. These are innocent Queenslanders. And there are many, many, many of them that their lives were ruined. Um, so, and then their children, who are now in their 40s and 50s, of course, have to suffer, and then on we go and on we go. But I'm, I'm just trying to say that what, what happened, uh, what, what seemed seemingly innocuous 30, 40, 50 years ago, is still having a very real impact on people in this state today. Mm. Well, when you think, you know, there were, there were over 30,000 people who had special branch files, and they were being used against them in surreptitious manners to undermine their careers and, and prevent them from advancing in the society to do all sorts of negative things to their lives. Mm. That's a very big set of files. And then, of course, we expunge those files by, by destroying them, mm. most of them anyway. Mm. And uh, we seem to do this, you know. We seem to, like, go through these terrible periods and sweep it under the carpet as if it has never happened and go on saying, Queensland is such a bland place where nothing very serious ever happens. <laughs> you know? Well, that and how powerful and political and still present the, that history is, is probably a good place. Although I think there's an, I was about to wind it up, a good place to stop. But I think we've got a few more now. Sorry, there's one down the front. Well, my apologies for pick, coming very late, but just picking up on the last little bit there. I suspect that um, some of the work that Phil Dickey, you know, in the Moonlit State, or Moonlight State, 
Mm. Um, yeah. hasn't, hasn't, and I'd love to hear a bit more of it being pursued, but I think what we now have is a scared state. I think we always had that, and it still exists. So there are frightening stories, for example, about how the CMC operates now in terms of what it was meant to do, and, and all the CA, CJC. There's a whole area there which hasn't been investigated, and there are current stories. The other issue, I think, is that as people get a little older, um, the ability to threaten them reduces. So it might be a conscious exercise, conscience exercise, but also... If you're in business or employed or whatever, you've always got that, we won't call it the sword of Damocles, another sort of sword hanging over your head. Mm. Um, and I suppose examples of that would be blacklists that now replace the more overt filing systems mm. um, of the special branch, for example. Um, people who, who've, who've made complaints or, or been up you know, against the government, as it were, m more critically in, in an, an analytical sense who just don't get jobs from the government or, or who, in fact, lose, lose their job. I think there's a whole... So I think you're right to say there's that, that, that gap, but also um, it's becoming obvious, at least to me and some others, that there's a, there's a problem with the process now being more... And I hate to use the term, but probably it's the smart part of the smart state. Now it does it better. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, I actually got... I was just interested to know um, if there are any special branch files um, left. Where, where would you find them? I, I, I probably had one, but I was assumed it was um, Well, Well, you, you might find them in the ASIO archives in Canberra, but I don't think you'll find many still in Queensland. I think some were saved, but even the ones... People I know that saw part of their file, uh, that, those files had been vetted, so there was fairly innocuous material that was turned over to them. So, um, you know, it would have been one, a wonderful um, historical resource to have mm -hmm. those files, particularly for your book. There, there uh, are still special branch offices around, though, are they yes, alive? Yes, I can tell you what went on. Yeah, that's right. And in theory, of course, they are supposed to archive their material, either in the state archives if they're a state agency or in the national archives. But, mm. um, but you can read a lot of those things with an awful lot of blacking out. Yes. Mind you, sometimes you can then work out who the... Um, who the spy is, because they don't get... I mean, you, you can read through those files and read a whole lot of things even into what's been blacked out of them. Mm. I mean, ha having said that, I mean, history, history is never dead. It, um, I've been interviewing, you know, 85-year-old policemen, policemen in their 70s and 80s, and uh, have been warned by one to be careful. So age mm. doth mm. not diminish the man, if that makes no, sense. No, that's mm. right. Well, that's a pretty powerful point to end on, I think. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And I'd like to make a special thank you to Kate, Matt and Raymond for providing us with insight into our states this afternoon. I found it a very interesting afternoon indeed. So thank you very much for your time. Please join us on Level 4 um, for more exploration of our history and its artefacts in the John Oxley Library Reading Room. Um, if you want more information about the events happening at the State Library or in the John Oxley Library, please look at our website or come and approach any of the staff members this afternoon. Thank you. <coughs>